Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in today. We're just so thankful for you. Uh, the, those who watch the videos every week and, and join us and connect with what's going on at the Upper Room, we just really love you and appreciate you guys. We are in the fourth week of our series, Future You, and we've been just really moving through it and having fun. First week, we asked the question, who is future you? Who do I want to be a few years from now? And is that where I'm heading? Because if not, if where I'm heading is not where I want to be, then now's the time to make a change. The second week of the series, we asked, why is it so difficult to change? And we found that the answer is inertia. Inertia is either our best friend or our worst enemy. Then last week, we asked the question, how are we going to change? And we just saw that the answer is little by little, one step at a time. And what God wants us to do is not always going to have uh, visible progress right away. We're going to be taking steps of obedience sometimes long before we see the effects of it in our lives. Now today, uh, I want to issue a bit of a wake-up call. And we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 20. Uh, so in 1 Kings chapter 20, we're, we see this scene of a soldier standing before a king. And this, the soldier is dusty and he's clearly war-torn. The battle's just finished. He's got a bandage across his head. His eyes is uh, clearly puffy and bloody. And he looks like he's just barely hanging on. And, and standing before this king, he speaks to give an account of what he did during the battle. And in 1 Kings 20, verse 39, it says this. It says, Your servant went out into the midst of the battle, and there a man came over and brought a man to me and said, Guard this man. If by any means he is missing, your life shall be for his life, or else you shall pay a talent of silver. While your servant was busy here and there, he was gone. Then the king of Israel said to him, So shall your judgment be. You yourself have decided it. So we have a picture of a guy who was told, In this battle you have a job. The job is to take this prisoner and to watch him, guard him, keep him. The point is, don't let him get away. In fact, the man was told, if he gets away, your life's going to be required for his life. Or you'll have to pay a talent of silver, which I would pick that option if it were me. But uh, you have to understand, a talent of silver is a, is a ton of money. A talent is 72 pounds. A soldier in this war would have had no way of paying that sum of money, 72 pounds of silver. So basically, if he lets this guy get away, he's going to have to die. And he lets the man get away. As he gives this accounting, he says, I watched him at first, I was checking in on him, but eventually the man, I let him out of my sight, and he got away. And he's bringing it to the king almost like, what, what do you think should happen to me? I let him get away. But king, come on, I had good intentions. I tried really hard. I, I watched him most of the time. I mean, there was like five, a five-minute window, but you know, nobody's perfect. He's saying this to the king, almost hoping for mercy. And what the king says is, listen, you told me yourself that you were warned. If you let him get away, your own life would be required, so shall your judgment be. And once the king had said those words, uh, the man then pulled off his bandages and showed actu that actually he was not a soldier at all. In fact, he was a prophet. He was a man of God sent by God to confront King Ahab with this made-up story that he has. It was made up by the prophet. Now please read this whole story later this week because you will find out how this prophet got wounded. He really did have a bloody eye. He really was beat up. And I need you to read about how the man got wounded uh, that tricked the king because it involves a lion. That's all I'm going to say. The Bible's incredible. You should have read it. But the reason this prophet had told this story is because it was to be a, a mirror held up to make the king realize, oh, I'm the man. I'm the man who had a job that he was given. I'm the man that was told, you have this thing to do. And if you don't do it, your life will be forfeited uh, for your disobedience to God. So, the, now the particulars of why King Ahab needed this message had historical context and significance in what, in what happened in that exact day. But... What exactly this parable meant to him isn't the most important issue for us today. Because Ahab is dead and buried. In fact, the dogs licked up his blood. That's also in the Bible. The bigger, the bigger issue for us is this question. What does it have to do with me? Because I believe the story, as it was told, is meant to hit us hard. 
for us to see that we too have been given an assignment. So I want us to do what the prophet of God wanted Ahab to do. I want us to insert ourselves in the story. And I think it can be very easy to read the Bible and just think, well, that's, you know, that's good for Daniel. That's good for Esther. That's amazing for Paul. What an, what an inspiring story. But I think this isn't just about them. It's about you. What are you going to do with what you've been given? And I want us to see ourselves in the story about a man who was given a charge to watch over someone. And the, and the king at some point is going to stand before us and we're going to have to explain to him what we did with the one job we were given. So, okay, maybe you're saying, okay, cool, cool story, bro, but who are we supposed to watch? The answer is, you are meant to watch the most difficult person to babysit on the planet. I'm not talking about your husband. I'm not talking about your wife. I'm not talking about your kids. I'm talking about you. The person on this planet most suited to deceit is you. The person on this planet most capable of harming yourself is you. You and I are, in fact, able to be like no one else, our own worst enemy. And the Bible from beginning to end warns us about how important it is that we watch ourselves, that we keep ourselves. We are the soldier who is meant to guard the other soldier. Only the other soldier we're meant to guard is us. And that's clearly evident from the fact that if we don't do the job we're meant to do of, of keeping ourselves, our lives will be forfeit. Why? Because our life will be snatched from us while we aren't paying attention. And that's precisely when it happens. And that's why the soldier says, notice what he says in verse 40. When did, the guy get, when did the guy get away? Guard this man, he was told. Keep this man. Keep this person. Guard this person. Don't let them get away. And when he finally said they got away, the king must have been like, well, when did he get away? How did he get away? What happened? And he says, that's the most embarrassing part. He said, I was busy here and there. Then he was gone. Is it possible that while you're going here and there, your life is passing you by, your life is getting away? The future you that Jesus sees you are capable of becoming is slipping away. The who you're meant to be, what you're meant to be like as you grow up in Christ, you're meant to guard yourself and watch yourself, supervise yourself, lead yourself, that you might not escape, that you might not slip through your own fingers, so you don't end up stuck immature, end up stuck selfish, end up stuck with a small mentality, uh, living in self-pity and discontent, smothered by anger and numbing and coddling yourself spiritually when you're meant to rise up and live in power. So this is your wake-up call. You are called by God to guard yourself, to keep this man, to keep this woman, and to look after yourself, lest you get away. Didn't Jesus himself say that it's easy to chase after the things of this world and lose your soul? Now, my whole life, I've kind of thought of that as like, oh man, that's intense. Like, lose your soul? Gosh, I need to hang on to my soul. I don't want to lose my soul. But the words that he uses in that sentence don't speak about losing your soul entirely. A better translation really is lose yourself. You could lose your true self to let yourself get away. And I think what Jesus is warning in Matthew 16 is the same thing that's, that's in 1 Kings chapter 20, that we're meant to not be distracted and busy here and there and chasing after this and defined by that. And all of a sudden, we got the things that we, we thought we wanted, but we ended up losing the version of ourselves that we were meant to be. And on and on, warnings come throughout the Bible about how easy it is to trick yourself. How easy it is to deceive yourself. How easy it is to let yourself get away. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. There's no area quite like the heart that's able to control the outcome of our lives. Jude says in his little book, verse 21. Guard and keep yourselves in the love of God. Expect and patiently wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jeremiah warns the same thing when he says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So our hearts are able to steer us. Our hearts are able to trick us. We have to guard our hearts. We have to guard our spirits. We have to guard our devotion. We have to choose to do the, the hard things, to watch after ourselves, to be checking in with ourselves and, and others, to be asking the question, hey, time's passing. How am I doing? 
Am I getting better? Am I staying the same? Am I coasting? Am I fighting? Am I advancing? Am I becoming a kinder husband? Am, am I becoming a better father? Am I becoming a more patient parent, more patient manager? Your heart's tricky. Your heart will talk you into doing things you shouldn't do. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These things will all deceive us. We have to guard ourselves. We have to keep ourselves. You can't just be cruising through life doing what you feel and going along with what's easy. Because broad is the path that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. And few are they who find it. Why? Because it's so easy to let yourself get carried away. To let your heart pull you in a way you shouldn't go. To fall for the lies that the devil tells. You have to be actively involved, vigilantly involved, intentional about your life. He says, guard this man. That's active. Jesus said in Mark 14, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. If you know you're weak, you make it easy on yourself to do the right things with guardrails. You make it easy on yourself to do the right things with accountability. You make it easy on yourself to do the right things with systems. You have to be intentional about spiritual formation. Like being in a small group of Christians who are praying for you weekly, holding you accountable, praying for each other. We know that our, f our flesh is weak, so what do we do? We watch and pray. So that future you, that man, that woman that you're meant to grow into won't slip through your fingers. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21 says, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. The human, the human heart, it's been said, is in, it's an idol factory. It can value anything above God and churn out a new idol every day. So you have to guard yourselves. Meaning it will be easy and automatic for your heart to gravitate to other things as more valuable than Him. That's why the Bible says we have to seek first the kingdom of God. Right? Every, sing, every, every single time I get paid and I give my tithe to God, what am I doing? I'm trying to keep myself from idols. Because it's easy and automatic for my heart to gravitate to things. But I have to keep myself. I have to keep this man. So this is your wake-up call. Your life's passing you by. You need to fight to guard over the version of yourself that you're meant to be. The future you, you are supposed to be. Otherwise, your life will pass you by and you will wake up one day, maybe with regret. And ultimately, you will stand before God to give an account of what you did with this life. And I don't want you to have to go, I don't even know. I was busy here and there. There's a point when I heard his voice. There's a point when I sensed his spirit. I knew as I read his word there was something to it, but yeah, I let me get away. I didn't guard myself. So two things to be on guard against as you, as you keep this man, as you keep this woman. First is giving in. Giving in. It's so easy to give in. In our world that we live in to, to cultures, distractions, right? we carry around with us the biggest distraction ever invented at all times. A device that can simultaneously feed and nourish your spirit or completely distract you. We live in a day when it's possible to be glued to your phone so much that it, to, to, that it messes up the wiring in our brains and our souls. To be perpetually dissatisfied. Never able to be present where we are because we're looking at where we wish we were. What we wish we were doing. The life we wish we had. It's easy to give in to distraction. Secondly, don't give in to lies. Lies like, I'll always be this way. Lies like, I've tried to change before and it didn't work, so why would it work this time? We give in to lies like, it's okay that I'm this way because I know other people who are worse than me. Listen, there will always be someone in your life more jacked up than you are. And we kind of almost sometimes like to keep some messed up people in our lives, just so we can feel good about ourselves a little bit, really, quite frankly. This, by the way, is why any time that we take steps to better ourselves, there will be people in our lives who kind of push back, like, oh, you've changed. And first of all, I, yeah, I would hope so. I don't want to stay the same as I was when I, when I was at 20. I don't want to be the same person I was when I was 40. I want to change. I want to grow. I want to improve myself. But if you try to start changing and someone in your life pushes back and tries to hold you back, guess what? They're only angry because they're now realizing if you change, they're going to have to look at their life and maybe change too. So they don't want you to change because you, you make them feel good about themselves. And so what we need to 
all do is realize we don't want to give in to other people's plans for our life. We were called to guard this man, not them. You are going to stand before God for your life. They will get their turn. And Jesus modeled for, the, for us this in John chapter 6, when after he fed the 5,000, everybody's super pumped, and everybody wanted an autograph, everybody wanted a selfie, everybody wanted something. It says, verse 15, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. He wouldn't let them take him by force to make him a king. He went to be alone with the Father, who was able to remind him, you already are a king. You see, many people, if you give in to their plans for your life, they'll try to give you an imitation substitute version of what you're supposed to be. So Jesus didn't need to go with these people who were going to try and make him a king because he was already a king. By remembering who God said he was, he was able to combat the pressure to give in to who people wanted him to be. And I want to let you know something. You will not be the future you you are supposed to be if you live for the approval of other people. Living to please people will keep you from pleasing God. So don't give in. You are already a son or a daughter of the King of Kings. The second temptation will be to give up. Giving up is a very real temptation. For some of us, we've made the mistake of giving up control, and we need to take back our lives from the things that we have willingly submitted our lives to. We need to guard ourselves to not be controlled by a substance, uh, to be controlled by emotions, to just do what we feel, to let our anger overtake us, uh, to be controlled by habits or patterns of thinking. We need to keep ourselves and guard ourselves with all diligence from the mistake of giving up control. And also the temptation to just give up because it's hard. I mean, come on, is this season feeling hard for anybody else? 2020 was somewhat of a trash fire. 2021 isn't looking so good yet. And so it's hard to keep going. But, but listen, all seasons have difficulties in them. Uh, you know, remember back to 2019 when everything was perfect? Oh yeah, really? Back in 2019 when all of us complained all the time about something different? Right? So if it's not this, it's going to be something else. The reality is life is hard. And the reality is that following Jesus is difficult. But here's the good news. Our God is so good that he says things like this. Psalm 81, verse 16. He says, But I would feed you with the finest wheat. I would satisfy you with wild honey from the rock. I love that verse. Our God is so good that he is able to bring honey out of rocks for us. And I love it because you don't get honey from rocks. That's why it's, it's exactly why it's so powerful. Tim Keller says, God uses our troubles to show us where true joys are to be found. He gives us unlikely food from impossible places. What he wants to sustain you with might just come in a strange wrapper called COVID-19 or called a, the loss of a job or called a challenging circumstance. But it's in that rock that you've been handed that God's, God wants to squeeze honey out into your life. So don't give up. Don't give in. Romans 13 puts it this way, and I'm going to close with this. This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day. We must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and in drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. See, so you have one life. And as the poem says, it will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last. So guard and keep yourself. Amen. Jesus, thank you for this time and for your word. Thank you for every single person whose heart is being stirred by your spirit, realizing the need to wake up to what's really happening, wake up to the lies and deceit of the culture, uh, waking up to the deceitfulness of sin, real realizing that there are things in our lives that maybe we need to jettison if we're going to become who we're meant to be, the future you were supposed to be. And I pray that even now, as, as you're ministering to people's hearts, that you will stir up a resolve of, of decision in a time for action, that I want to guard after this woman. I want to guard after this man. 
I want to take ownership of myself and leadership of my own heart to keep myself in the love of God, knowing that he is able to keep me from stumbling and he's able to present me as faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Lord, there is a need for us to rise up and become who we're meant to be. So help us, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.